ever since Eve got deceived by that slithery liar and ate that apple, we have been on a downward spiral. So what do we do? Since life as we know it is inherently flawed, how do we hang on to the abundant joy that God promised? And furthermore, how do we, how do we navigate life with joy without becoming immune or indifferent to the very real heartbreak happening all around us? Well, for starters, the Bible says grief and joy are not mutually exclusive. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs, it says that during laughter, the heart may still ache. That means delight and despair coexist, which may sound like an emotional Rubik's Cube that is kind of hard to live out, but there are a lot of saints who model that very well. Take Hannah, for instance. Her story is in the beginning of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. And when we're first introduced to Hannah, her story seems anything but joyful, partly because she's married to a polygamist named Elkanah. And she has a sister wife who is just a mean hoochie mama who is determined to aggravate Hannah every single day. But most of all, Hannah grieves because she longs to have children yet she struggles with infertility. This is the beginning of Hannah's story, chapter one, beginning in verse three. Now this man, he's talking about Elkanah here, Hannah's husband. Now this man used to go up year by year from a city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, that's the mean sister wife, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year after year as often as Hannah went up to the house of the Lord. Penina used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? I can absolutely identify with Hannah's grief, but I cannot identify with her methodology with the whole pushing away from the table thing. Because in my opinion, uh, a hot Krispy Kreme or some chips and queso, they can pull somebody out of a really deep pit. I can't imagine trying to lament and limit my carb intake at the same time. But poor Hannah does, and ultimately becomes so disheartened by her situation that she ends up hurling herself on the altar with such palpable grief that the priest on duty thinks she's had one too many Bloody Marys before church. We pick it up at verse 10. Hannah was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. As she continued, verse 12, praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul to the Lord. Don't you love that scripture clarifies that Hannah was emoting greatly in the house of God? I think one of the biggest fallacies in communities of faith is that the closer we get to Jesus, the more we have to put a lid on it. But y'all, that is not biblically defensible. Nowhere in scripture will you find a commandment that says God wants us to put a smile on our face when we're dying in our heart. That's just not true. God welcomes us to come before us with our need. As a matter of fact, all throughout the Gospels, you'll find Jesus encouraging people to admit that they're sick and they need a healer, that they can't make themselves well. I had a surgeon not too many years tell me that I was a bad patient. And it hurt my feelings because I really like this doctor. But he explained, he said, Lisa, you are so determined to hide your pain. And because you aren't honest with me about your pain, it makes me think that you must have reticence about my capacity as a healer. Oh, if I hadn't gone on general anesthesia so soon after that, I would have been super convicted. God compels us to acknowledge when we need his help. 
Now back to the end of Hannah's story or the end of this chapter in her story. It's so beautiful, such a redemptive ending. Verse 19 of 1 Samuel 1 says, They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. That's Hebrew for hubba hubba hubba. They were married. They had an intimate moment. And the Lord remembered her, and in due time Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. I think it's so cool that Samuel's name literally means the Lord heard. So in 10 short verses, Hannah has gone from great grief to great joy. And that emotional flexibility, seemingly from a very low place to a very high place, lies in Hannah's spiritual fortitude. The fact that whether she was grieving or celebrating, she knew that God had her back. And y'all, that's the key to staying sane when the world around us seems anything but sanity and serenity are not defined by the absence of circumstantial storms, but in the safe harbor God provides in the midst of them. It would be disingenuous of me and disrespectful toward my friend who is grieving her husband for me to try to insert some happily ever after at this point in her story. It's appropriate for her to grieve right now. Plus, Jesus isn't some rabbit's foot who magically makes pain and hardship disappear. Instead, he is Emmanuel, God with us. So he doesn't shazam the hardship or the crazy away. Instead, he does something infinitely better, much more miraculous. He steps from glory to our world and he walks beside us. He guides and he leads us through difficult seasons. No matter what's going on in your personal corner of the world or the world around you, our God is still on the throne. Crazy is not the most important common denominator in human history. Redemption is. Just as God heard Hannah, He hears you today. He sees you. He loves you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And He will make a way where there seems to be no way.